who worry about their life shall learn that God knows all their needs. Those who have experienced the swarming locusts shall eat in plenty and be satisfied. Those who long for comfort shall be glad and rejoice. We praise your name, for you have dealt wondrously with us 
and will do so again. In Christ we pray. Amen. Now it's time for the welcome and announcements. Um, most everything's listed in the bulletin, but uh, it looks like Wednesday, December. Oh, you made me see the up there. <laughs> uh, it looks like Wednesday, December 1st, we have Bible study at 7 p.m. for those who wish to attend. Um, Sunday, December 12th, we have canned food collection coming and loose change collection. We also have coffee fellowship at 10 a.m. If you'd like to stay for that after the service, it's hosted by Linda Newton and King Lawler. Thank them for that. And uh, we also have a Christmas program coming up December 12th. Um, it's supposed to be at 5 o'clock in the afternoon for those who'd like to come to that. And Tina's heading that up. Anybody have questions, you can see her. And as far as I know, everything's going, coming along good with that. And that should be it. Does anybody have any other announcements that we need to bring forward? Okay. All right, and Stephanie will take over for the uh, pies and offerings and the prayer dedication. Would the ushers please come forward to the call the offering?
Please, re please remain standing as we read from the Psalter, Psalm 126, which can be, paid, which can be found on page 847 in your hymnal. Let's read responsibly. When the Lord restored the fortunes of Zion, we were like those who dreamed. Then our, then our mouth, mouth was filled with laughter, and our tongue with shouts of joy. Then they said among the nations, the Lord has done great things for them. The Lord has done great things for us. We are glad. Restore our fortunes, O Lord, like the water courses in the Najem. May, May those who sow in tears reap with shouts of joy. joy. Those who go forth weeping, bearing the seed for sowing, shall come home with shouts, shouts of joy, bearing their sheaves. Let's please reaffirm our faith reciting the Apostles' Creed, which is found on page 881 in your I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. The third day he rose from the dead, he ascended to heaven and sits at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Testament reading today is Joel chapter 2, verses 
21 through 27, page 1375 in the Pew Bible. Be not afraid, O land. Be glad and rejoice. Surely the Lord has done great things. Be not afraid of wild animals, for the open pastures are becoming green. The trees are bearing their fruit. The fig tree and the vine yield their riches. Be glad, O people of Zion. Rejoice in the Lord your God, for he has given you the autumn rains in righteousness. He sends you abundant showers, both autumn and spring rains as before. The threshing floors will be filled with grain. The vats will overflow with new wine and oil. I will repay you for the years the locusts have eaten, the great locust and the young locust, the other locust and the locust swarm. My great army that I sent among you, you will have plenty to eat until you are full, and you will praise the name of the Lord your God who has worked wonders for you. Never again will my people be shamed. Then you will know that I am in Israel, that I am the Lord of your, your Lord your God, and that there is no other. Never again will my people be shamed. Today's Gospel reading is Matthew chapter 6, 25 to 33. It's on page 1458. Therefore, I tell you, do not write about your life, what you will eat or drink, or about your body. What you will wear is not life more important than food, and the body more important than clothes. Look at the birds of the air, they do not sow or reap or store away in barns, and yet their heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not much more valuable than they? Who of you by worrying can add a single hour to his life? And why do you worry about clothes? See how the lilies of the field grow. They do not labor or spin, yet I tell you that not even Solomon in his splendor is dressed like one of these. If that is how God clothes the grass of the field, which is here today, and tomorrow is thrown into fire, will he not much more clothe you, O you of little faith? So do not worry, saying, What shall we eat, or what shall we drink, or what shall we wear? For the pagans run after these things, and your heavenly Father knows that you need them. But seek first his kingdom and his righteousness, and all these things were given to you as well. Good morning. 
morning, folks. Good morning. Good morning. This is exceptionally cool. I mean, all these people um, joining in the service is really heartening. Um, you know, like they say, this, the burden is smaller when there's more hands working together. And so it's really true. And it's not a burden to be up here. Um, please join me in the flip prayer of illumination as I begin this message today. Dear Lord, your word, your way, your direction, your path reigns supreme. You, Christ, are the King. Help my words be your direction, only illuminating your path. You know, again, when all of, us, all of us are working together today, I keep seeing the simplest little thing in my mind. That's the kind of thing you would want to show Gunner. I don't know if you all remember, jeez, I'm so uncoordinated. Remember that when you did that when you were a kid? You went like this. This is the church. This is the steeple. You look inside. You see all the people. It's cool. We're seeing lots of people and everybody's participating. We are um, the body of Christ. We are the hands and feet of Christ. And it's so cool to see everybody working together that way. Pastor Barry asked me like a couple weeks ago for the title of this message, and I wasn't able to give it to him. And it's a good thing I didn't, because the title I had changed a couple days ago, so it's a darn good thing. But the title is this. It's that simple. So keep that in mind. Allow me to give you a little peek into the Radolinsky or Rad Castle about the dogs and the cats. There's one dog. That's a big, spoiled wuss. Oops, I was going to take my mask off. There's one dog that is a big, spoiled wuss. He's a, she is a fluffy Newfoundland, nearly 120 pounds. We like to call her Princess Aria. And she has issues. Her body is so tall and long that she basically hails two different zip codes. I mean, sometimes I feel like I'm playing the old game Twister when I step over her body and the other bodies in the house to get around our tiny little house. Seriously, it's like, you know, stepping like this and my balance isn't too good anyway. If she hears thunder or if she doesn't get her way or if she's afraid her daddy, John, has been petting another dog, she tries to go under the bed, pout, but only her head will fit. She's something else. So she's a whole big story herself. And then there's three spoiled cats they're another long story, including the three-legged $5,000 cat that belongs to my daughter that we have. And then there, this is the one I'm getting to, Joe. Joe is a pointer or a pointer cross. He was found by my daughter, Lily, about 10 or 11 years ago. Would that be about right, Lily? Something like that, okay. He was walking down the middle of Bloomsbury Road. He was a mess. She brought him home, but it wouldn't take much for Lily to do that. He was loaded with fleas, ticks, and he was visibly petrified of many people, especially men. We knew he had been abused. Now he's about 14 years old, and he's a very, very happy dog. But sometimes you wouldn't know it to watch him. Job was aptly named after the Job of the Old Testament who suffered, as I'm sure most of you know, great trials and tribulations and still remained faithful. So Job has kind of done that. He's been through trials and tribulations and he's definitely as faithful as all get out. Point of this glimpse into, my point of this glimpse into the rad or Radulinsky pets is all about Job. My husband John likes to say, Job is a reflection of this dog's favorite person in the world, which is me. Joe and I developed a special bond when we took him in. Our cattle dog that we had then, Zeke, rest, may he rest in peace, bit a hole through Joe's floppy ear. He was pretty jealous. That bite bled for two to three hours while I had held pressure on it and consoled poor sweet Joe. He does really love me. But he also goes around the house when he is not catching some doggy Z's, 
pacing nervously back and forth, door to door, table to bed, everywhere, emitting annoying whines all, a lot of the time, most of the time. 14 years old, yet he finds the energy for all that worrying, all that pacing, his tail wagging nervously, often knocking things over, literally, um, all that worrying. I can walk him two to three miles, and as soon as I get home, he's back to worrying. He wouldn't even know he was tired. Frankly, I think he also forgets he even had a walk. Yet, he still seems very happy. Well, as much as I hate to admit it that John is right about something, he is. <laughs> this is the truth. Joe worries about everything just like me. I seem to need to have, I really need to have something to worry about. I guess partly it's the mother in me, I don't know. I don't know what's with me, but I do worry. And worry is part of where our scripture is leading us today. The Bible, much of it, is so full of guidance on how to live the life, walk the walk, talk the talk, to live the life that puts God first. It occurred to me that it really is a simple task in some ways. I really don't think God wants to make it so hard for us he wants us to turn our lives over to him, so why make it complex? So it, it's all that simple, yet all still part of an enormously extensive, multifaceted, somewhat mysterious relationship that we have with our Lord. I teach the biological sciences, and part of my job is to guide my students through their discovery of the very complex, molecular, cellular, and extensive emergent properties of life, all the fascinating relationships between all small and large components of life, they totally energize me. I mean, I'm so excited about it, maybe over so, over, over so. When I took biology in high school some 10, 20 years ago, <laughs> and even in college, we knew so much less than we do now. We know so much more now than we did when I started teaching 34 years ago. And so much less than we will know when I retire to Pine Box. Um, the more we know, the more we don't know is kind of what it is in the sciences. Just DNA alone is super complex yet magnificent. That complexity is part of what interests me, but I as a teacher need to break it down into the small puzzle pieces that can be put together to understand the more intricate processes. I need to make it all that simple. I have to make it easier for the students to want to put the pieces of the puzzle together to become an enlightened student of the study of life. Well, maybe that's the way God wants it too. Christ is the key to a mysterious amalgamation of Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. I don't think he wants to make turning your life over to him dirt simple, but I don't think he wants to make it unattainable. Today we celebrate Christ the King Sunday and the, few, the, the week previous to Thanksgiving as well. Christ the King Sunday is a feast from the Catholic Church that began with Pope Pius XI in 1925, so in the, in the scheme of things, that's not that long ago. This Pope wanted to emphasize basically three things, that the Church has a freedom and immunity from the state, something we look for that we hold, hold high in this country, Leaders and nations, secondly, would see that they are bound to giving respect to Christ. And third, that the faithful gain strength and courage from this celebration that reminds us that Christ must be king in our hearts, minds, will, and bodies. Our first scripture that we had today, or one of our scriptures today, the first one I'm talking about, is 1 Timothy from the epistles. And just background, you know, first, the, the, the author of this was thought to be Paul. 
and we think not so much now. It's probably written about a generation after Paul. Uh, however, it sounds like it's written by Paul because often authors then would honor a leader, and Paul was a leader, the Apostle Paul, by identifying them as the author, so writing in the vein of their, of their thoughts. Anyway, this passage begins with a nod to the leaders of the day, the kings of the day, the leaders. The writer asks from Scripture, I read, Petitions, prayers, intercession, and thanksgiving be made for all people, for kings and all those in authority, that we may live peaceful and quiet lives in all godliness and holiness. This is good and pleases God our Savior, who wants all people to be saved, to come to a knowledge of the truth. God wants us to submit our lives to him. He doesn't want to make it so difficult. The scripture goes on to say, For there is one God and one mediator between God and mankind, the man Christ Jesus. So this really shows us that any great authority attributed to leaders then or now is really an illusion when compared to the real authority to Christ our King. He's the real one in charge. Our author states here, I am telling the truth, I am not lying, and a true and faithful teacher of the Gentiles me, the author. It's really Christ who is the King. Christ suffered a painful death for our eternal life with him. It's that simple for us. Is Christ your king? Our scripture from the prophet Joel, an Old Testament prophet that at least in part referenced the end times or at least cataclysmic happenings that would be coming, he warned in the previous scripture to this uh, Joel 2, chapter 2, um, he warned previously of a barren earth left by a locust infestation. But here in the second chapter of Joel that we read, verses 21 through 27, he tells us how God will restore us from devastation. The scripture says, Be glad, people of Zion. Rejoice in the Lord your God, for he has given you the autumn rains because, excuse me, because he is faithful. So he restores us. This scripture reminds me of the wonder of this planet and its environment. God restores. He has equipped us with the atoms, with the matter that became this marvelous earth and indeed nature. When not intervened, not interrupted by humans, it will restore itself. Maybe we must step back. Let Christ be the king, let him rule this earth, help nature restore itself after the time of locust. Maybe we are now seeing the beginning of a new metaphorical locust infestation, this disregard for the planet that we see now. This earth that will repair itself is magnificently engineered to provide all that it needs but it has received a setback from that balance. Human intervention prevents the restoration. There's a whole lot that I could say, but why would it be hard to see that we must take measures to set that balance back into motion? It's that easy. Maybe not that simple in terms of actions, but when you consider the alternative, the decision, to help her is easy. Finally, in today's gospel from Matthew 6, verses 25 to 33, we are amid the instructional Sermon on the Mount. We now really get to that worry issue. Scripture reads, Therefore I tell you, do not worry about your life, what you will eat, what you will drink, or about your body, what you will wear. Is not life more than food, the body more than clothes? Look at the birds of the air. They do not sow or reap or store away in barns, and yet your heavenly Father feeds them. I just read from the scripture that Michaela shared with us, which was one of the coolest things I've seen, because I remember Michaela when she was little like this, and now she's this beautiful young lady, and she's 
here at our church, helping in our church, and that's wonderful. But back to the scripture, you know, he's talking about the birds of the air and how they don't, they don't take food or they don't store it away in barns. Well, I don't believe that he's telling us that those things, you know, storing food, etc., are not important. This part about birds, you know, not storing away, I have to jump in and say it's really only partly true because there are birds that do store things away, woodpeckers and some others for future, for future times. So I don't believe God is telling us that those things are not important. I don't think he's telling us not to store, not to plan, not to be making intelligent decisions, but rather to know where your priority is, to know where your priority is. He says in the scripture, For the pagans run after all these things, and your heavenly Father knows that you need them. But seek first his kingdom and his righteousness, and all these things will be given to you as well. Those last words, but seek first his kingdom and his righteousness, and all these things will be given to you as well, just <coughs> echoes that hymn, Seek ye first the kingdom of God. It's a beautiful hymn. But to worry in this way, to worry like that, is to be suspect that God will neglect us. Basically not trusting that he's going to take care of things. So the extent of our worries can be a problem. Your priority must be to put God first. He will take care of the rest. And God simplified the path to walk with him. Really simplified. The book of Leviticus in the Old Testament had at least 613 commandments. And then the Pharisees of Jesus' time made it even worse. I, I, don't, I don't know how anybody could follow all the laws that there were, literally speaking, I'm serious. Listen to these words from Matthew chapter 22, verses 37 through 40, from Christ himself. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. This is the great and first commandment. And the second is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. On these two commandments depend all the law and the prophets. Your commandments, therefore, your direction is thus simplified. Love the God, Lord, love the Lord your God with all your heart and soul, and in turn, love and treat others as you would want them to be treated yourself. It's simplified. When I found myself in time of renewal of my faith, one of the times when I had a young family, I really could not conceive of putting anything above my children. And I'm sure most of you parents out there can understand where I'm coming from. Our children are so precious to us. But then I finally understood God knows what we need. If we put him first, he will take care of what we need. Now, you've got to be honest about all of that, though, when I say that. Honestly, we never know the real outcome, what it will be on this earth. Bad things, sad things will happen. We are not a people of a prosperity gospel, which means we don't, we don't believe that if we follow God, then we're going to have the money that we need, or we're going to have everything that we need on this earth all the time. It doesn't really work that way. But what we ultimately need is our relationship with God. And that relationship for those we love as well. I'm sure I will continue to worry about things. Like, like my husband mentioned. Will my husband and I be able to fly to Austria as we have planned in a few weeks to see my son and his wife amidst a renewed lockdown there. Will all my children be healthy, well, walk with God? I will worry, and I'm, I am sure Joe, Joe the Pointer will continue to worry. He will pace about nervously until his dying day. But I have a, but I have a choice my sweet, sweet dog Joe does not have. I can work strive daily to put those worries into prayer. I will remind myself that Christ is the King. 
ruler over all. God is in control. He knows our needs. Put God first in your lives, and he will restore. It's all that simple. Amen. 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 Closing hymn is on page 672, God be with you till we meet again.